Welcome to the Ask Little Video Store. Today I'm going to talk about my miserable experience of making a short film in 48 hours. Or the alternate title, the making of my short film, A Key to Death. Now to begin this story, I have to first explain why in the world would I make a short film in 48 hours. If you haven't heard about the 48 hour film challenge, I am now going to explain how it works. Most of the time, these challenges are organized by a local movie theater, such as my challenge. The challenge begins on Friday, usually around 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. That depends on what time you arrive at the theater, and you are given a random genre, a prop, and a line of dialogue. These are stipulations you have to meet up in order to make your short film for the next 48 hours, and you have to turn it in in the same time that you enter the contest. If you enter the theater and got out there around 6 o'clock, you have to be there at 6 o'clock, or at the latest be there at 8 to turn it in on a USB flash drive. Now I've been fascinated on this type of challenge ever since I saw this video from Austin McConnell and he talks about like oh this is a survival guy you know how to make a short film in 48 hours I was like oh I really want to try that out that will sound fun. I didn't really consider it until 2023. Then I found out that my local movie theater has the 48 hour film challenge and they were about to have it in that year and they've been doing it for a few years so I thought might as well try out. I was pretty excited to find out about it. This was just made up in my mind but I felt like one of the required rules was having a team. Plus it would be better working with a team. So I called up my cousins and asked them if they were interested in helping me out with the challenge. Because they can drive they will be more flexible when it comes to going to location by location plus it could be an additional actor along with the fact that I have no idea how to drive and I still don't know how to drive. Unfortunately both of them said they were busy that weekend mainly with school or work so I never signed up for that year's challenge because I thought I needed a team. And since then for over a year into early 2024 I just moved on, worked on other short films of course and I began my first semester in college which I had a film club but during my time in that club I was able to make some friends who were interested in making movies like me. In early 2024, I was reminded again about the 48 hour film challenge coming up in my local theater, mainly because I like looking at the listings ahead of time in order to figure out what movies they're playing. And I noticed in the March section, two weeks after the challenge took place, they're going to have a premiere event. There was an event after the challenge. If your short film gets picked to be in the top 16 short films, then it could be shown in the theater and it might have a chance of you know winning prizes like best actor or best short film i think there's like another one but it's kind of flying over my head right now when i saw that i thought to myself i might as well try out this year's challenge because i knew more people who were interested in making movies so I believed I had a better chance to assemble a team in order to compete in the challenge. Before I called up anybody to work on the 48 hour film challenge, I paid for the registration fee in order to make sure I have a spot in the challenge itself. It wasn't too expensive, I think it was like 20 to 25 dollars. But I knew for the fact that in the rules it states that you could work by yourself in making a short film or you could work in a team from 1 to 11 people. But I was mostly hoping for the fact that I would work with a team at least two people or three people instead of working by myself because that would just be too overwhelming of a project for me to do. So in February I called up all my filmmaking buddies and see if they were interested in being a part of my team. All of them said no. Three different reasons was that one, they were already in teams. Now I find this to be an interesting point. It stated in the rules of the challenge that you could work on two different teams. So you could be a team member on one team along with being a team member in another team. But apparently all the people who said no to me want to stick to their own teams. The second reason was I think this was like only for two or three people that they were just busy that weekend so they weren't able to show up. And another third reason was that like I talked to these uh, two of my friends and they said that they had very little experience on making short films and all that. They had interest in films but never really much of an experience making their own short films. So they were kind of worrying the fact that their first experience was making it in 48 hours. So I was like, no, oh, okay, you know, I guess I'm doing this by myself but I didn't want to work by myself. So I called the last person I would call up with which is my friend Emmett. Now from people who watch this uh, YouTube channel here and all that, you may know Emmett from the videos I made back in 2019 along with the short film Strange Horror Murder. The reason you don't see him often in my videos recently, well since literally 2019, is because he's a flaker. Which means that he will promise to show up for something and all that like helping out on a video. And then on the day of he's supposed to show up, he never shows up. 
mainly for X and Y Z excuses. Not really any substantiated excuse like, oh, there was a family emergency or there was a oh, like emergency doctor's appointment. Nothing like that. It's more like, yeah, no, uh, somebody come up, you know, something came up. I had to deal with that, you know. And that's why I didn't want to work with him again because like uh, the first time that happened was when we were working with each other on the short film Strange Horror Murder. By the way, this is Brian Acevedo and I am Emmett Eller. And this is our slasher movie. And we filmed that during 2019. And he showed up for day one and day two of filming. And then in the preceding weekend, stuff kept coming up for him. Where he says like, oh, I can't do it today because I have to go to church because I'm feeling sick. Uh, my parents are, con are concerned about my safety. I can't do it because something else come up and all that. Okay. Hey, I'm Brian. Today is like day three. He took me day three for filming this movie, not including the day I filmed the title. Oh, we got like delayed this film so much. Okay. So basically, I have like the script here, and I'm going to film one of the POV shot. Uh, one thing I was having to talk for Emmett uh, is not here. He didn't like pick up the. He didn't pick up the phone about 10 times or respond to any of my text messages. So I had to call my cousin Leo to help out with the last of the film and all that. And this actually put like a string hold in our, in the production of that short film. So in the original story for Strange Horror Murder, the, uh, the story revolved around these three friend characters who go into the forest, a day counter killer. The three friend characters was, was played by me, Leo, and the third one was supposed to be Emmett. But because he was no longer part of the project, we essentially had to just change the story. So instead of three friend characters, it's two friend characters. Later within the year, we were supposed to work on reviews with each other. The plan was to make three reviews with each other. One of them was A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, The Dream Child. One, two, three. Welcome to the Aswell Video Store. Today, I am with Emmett from Do Reacts. Emmett, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Emmett from Dude Reacts. I normally react to videos. Oh, okay. Hey. Hey, today we are going to review A Nightmare on Elm Street 5. I the dream child. And that was a glow fun to do. We filmed the reviews in my house, which was a short walking distance away from Emmett's house. We plan to film two more movie reviews, but I'm forgetting what movies we're supposed to review. But for both of those reviews, when it came time on the day of film to actually, you know, film them, Emma never showed up. What would happen on both occasions was that we set up a time for him to show up at 10 o'clock in the morning. Even though Emma knew this, he overslept up until 3 in the afternoon. While I was at my house wondering where do you go and why he wasn't picking up my calls, he would call me at 3 in the afternoon telling me, hey, I'm sorry, I couldn't show up, I just woke up. Then in early 2020, I had set forward plans on making a horror short film, The Killer from the River, and the idea was to have a three-person crew, me, Leo, and Emmett. I believe Emmett's role was supposed to be camera operator or one of the actors, but he still was going to be a part of the crew in some way. On the day of filming, it was Super Bowl Sunday. I remember that distinctly because we picked up Leo and he was complaining to me that we had to be back in a certain time after filming so that way he could watch the Super Bowl. Beforehand, me and Emmett agreed on to pick him up at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. We unfortunately arrived late around 12.50 mainly because my dad is not the type of person to wake up early in the morning. After we picked up Leo, we drove to Emmett's house and during that 10 or 15 minute drive, I kept calling him and, and I texted him. I was trying to tell him like, hey, we're going to pick you up in a few minutes. We arrived to his house, 10 unanswered phone calls later, one knock at the door, he didn't pick up. Nobody answered the door, which is kind of weird because he lives with family and all that. So why nobody heard a knock over the door? That beats me. We were short on time, so we decided to leave. And me and Leo realized that we have to work with each other by ourselves. So we started driving towards the filming location. And during our drive, Evan calls me up. And I was like, oh boy. So when I picked up the call, he was apologizing, saying like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just woke up. Uh, where are you guys and all that. And I was like, Emmett, we're already too far gone from your house. We can't like take a U-turn to pick you up and all that. We aren't like on a short time schedule here. And he's like, oh, sorry, 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 dude. So he texts me like, I think about 10 or 20 times. He just texts me with like one phrase, like, I'm sorry. I was like, dude, stop spamming me. But they see he's like, okay, I'm sorry. You know, just leave one more sorry there. Ever since then, I made a pledge to myself to never work with Emma again. 
because Flakers, of course, are unreliable. And since then, I've been remaining good friends with him and all of that, but I never invited him to work on any of my other projects. That is until when I called him up if he wanted to participate in being in my team for the 48 hour film challenge. Although this was a risky chance to do, I felt like he could have improved himself in the last four years. After I asked him if he was interested in joining the team, he agreed on helping out. So that was like my preparation that I had one person attached to it and all that. But everybody around me went and told him about Emmett working on this project was a little worried about me. Because they knew Emmett was a flaker, they were kind of concerned of me if that Emmett was going to do it again. But I had to believe that Emmett won't do it again, hopefully. After I agreed on helping me in the project, I was trying to find somebody else to be a part of the team. That's mainly for the factor that if Emmett drops out on the weekend of filming, at least I have another person to help me out on the project, even though it was ended up being a fruitless venture because I still got the same response of no. I had this one classmate who funny enough said no to me when I asked him to work on the 40 hour film challenge on the reason that he didn't have much experience making short films. He was trying to figure out ways for me to make sure Emmett would be part of the team so that way there won't be a chance for him to flake out at all. One idea was to force Emmett to pay for the registration fee or like a part of the registration fee and have it uphold it like you won't get back your $15 until until you finish this short film and help me work on it. Although the idea sounded funny, I didn't went along with it. We came up with some other ideas to try to keep MA within the project, but I think we just ended up with the feeling of, let's just hope for the best that he doesn't play cow and he's able to show up. A few weeks before the day of the challenge, I thought of an idea to have a brainstorming session to come up with stories for each possible genre that we may work with. So that way we wouldn't have to come up with a story on the spot and we already have like a like a story on the shelf. On a Monday, a week before the challenge, I caught up Emma to see if he was interested in a writing or brainstorming session to have on that week's Friday, which was a, exactly a week away from the challenge. Emma said yes, he would do it and along with the fact that he was, didn't have any plans for that day so there wasn't anything going on for him. And I was like okay. I was still worried about Emmett flaking on Friday and all that so I caught him up on Wednesday and double checked like hey are you still going to show up for Friday? He said well maybe. I was like what do you mean maybe? On Monday you told me yes you had nothing planned on Friday. Now you're telling me maybe? He's like well stuff happens you know. I was like so that would happen when you didn't show up for my Halloween or birthday party. Back in 2023 I invited Emmett over to both of those parties and for both of those occasions he said yes I was show up to them because I have nothing else planned on that day. For both of those parties, I called him on the day of the party. I was like, what time are you going to show up today and all that? And he responded like, well, actually, I'm at a friend's house right now. We're playing Magic the Gathering or Dungeons and Dragons, so I won't be able to show up for your Halloween party or birthday party. Back to the phone call, I brought that up to him and all that. And he was like, oh, you know my friend, he likes to hang out and all that. So I go hang out at his house. And I responded by saying like, you knew for the fact that I invited you ahead of time to be at both of those parties. And you said that you had nothing planned on those days. And then you tell me on the day of my parties, when I call you and you tell me, yeah, you're hanging out at your friend's house, so you're not gonna show up. And he's like, well, the reason is I didn't show up is because I forgot about them. So after the phone call, I was given the insurance that he will maybe show up on Friday. But along with an odd fact was that he was planning to walk from his house to my house. Now that would have been easy if it was 2019 when I was living in my mom's house. And that was like, you know, a short walking distance away from his house. I'm currently living in my dad's house. So walking from his house to my house was completely unreasonable unless you're an athletic person and a two hour work sounds like a no brainer. So this is Thursday, February 29th, and I texted him, Hey Emmett, ask your parents if they can drive you to my house because I seriously don't think you're willing to walk two hours to my house. And he responds with this, I also have to babysit tomorrow because my cousin is going to somewhere with her boyfriend. In response, I texted him, what time would that be? And then he responds back, DV is early in the morning. Mowing the lawn is after I get home. Babysitting is all day until my uh, cousin gets home from both work and wherever she's going with her boyfriend. On Saturday, I could probably drop in at around 1 and, and 2 o'clock, maybe? After I read his messages, I was kind of confused. I was like thinking, when you were planning to tell me this? 
because it's 8 o'clock at night. Are you going to tell me like later before 12 o'clock? Or are you going to tell me when I call you up on Friday saying where are you and you tell me all this information? So I responded with, okay, I will let you know tomorrow morning if I'm free on Saturday. At least you had the decency to tell me this tonight instead of tomorrow. He responds, I mean fair but ouch. I think I caught him up later on Friday saying I, I wasn't free on Saturday for a writing session because I'll be out of town. And we were scheduled it to have it on next Wednesday, two days before the challenge. And, th and guess what? He shows up 15 minutes ahead of time. Then he was supposed to show up. I was like, wow, you showed up ahead of time. So our writing session only lasted an hour or an hour and a half and it was quite insightful for us to do and all that because we were giving rough story ideas for each genre. But after that writing session, it gave me some hope for Friday. Like, yes, we have a good chance for this challenge. We're able to make forward with it. The rules say that you only need one representative of the team to show up for Friday to get the required line, prop, and genre. I told him he could stay at home on Friday and I could just be like, you know, our representative for the team. Two days later, it was now Friday. The day of the day. The Friday of the Friday. And all my friends were wishing me good luck and all that because they were like kind of worried of the fact that I might, well, I've probably made the short film by myself if I'm an inch flaked again and all that. The doors for the challenge to be open was at 6 o'clock and I showed up late. Even though I told my dad so many times before Friday that I had to be there at 6 o'clock. And he was like, what? What do you mean 6 o'clock? So I ended up showing around 6.10. I felt like it wasn't a very good start to showing up late for the challenge. And there was already a long line outside the theater. So I waited in line in costume just in case I had to start filming right after I got my required line, prop, and genre. Along with bringing a tripod and camera with me. Speaking on the required line, prop, and genre. I found out waiting in line that the required line was I saw something like that on YouTube and the required prop was a key. So during the wait of anticipation, I was trying to cover my head like, oh, what should I do with this two story elements? Like I saw something that on YouTube and the prop a key, like what should I do with these type of story elements I have to work with? Another thing I found out was that the genres are chosen by a wheel. Not an actual wheel, but it was like this digital wheel on a MacBook and you had to press on the touchpad to spin the wheel. Then it was my turn to spin the wheel. Firstly, they checked my registration to check I'm all good for the challenge and all that and I don't want to pay a nerd fee because I noticed there were some consistency ad problems like, oh, we checked your, reg we checked your name but you aren't registered. But thankfully, I registered ahead of time and I had proof. I had receipts. I pressed on the touchpad and the wheel spun and I got Spy Noir. And the event organizer asked me if I wanted to spin the wheel again. I said no, and I stuck with Spy Noir. Because if I get something else and I'm not happy with it, then I screwed myself over by not sticking with the first option and all that. During our brainstorming session, we didn't have too many ideas for Spy Noir, if I recall. Emmett was suggesting something along the lines of what we should do, like Hitchcock style. And the thing is, I'm not, I'm not really into average Hitchcock. I only seen Psycho and Strangers on a Train, but I was kind of not understanding what he meant about Hitchcock style. I think he probably was on the same boat, like, I don't know if he was see what kind of Hitchcock movies he's seen and all of that. He did have any ideas, like, what if it was like a spy, you know, went out, he had like one last vendetta, one last case he has to do and all that. And I think that was like the far as we ever thought about like spy noir. But we didn't really thought too much about it because I thought like, oh, what's the likely chance we're ever going to get him? And I en we ended up getting him. As I left the theater, I merely thought, wait a minute. I could just go back in the theater, just walk past the line, and record in the theater seats, and pretend that I'm watching a movie. And, you know, I got some good footage of that, and I shot that in color. Okay. Oh my God. First off, it's thriller if you want to keep it. Let's reroll. Reroll the genre you are stuck with then is... As I was filming that scene, I came up with a somewhat of a story, which was this eight like spy or agent had to go on a mission to like track down somebody who had a key and it was going around downtown to look for this person and for some reason he decided to stop by a movie theater to watch a movie. When I walked out of the theater I realized hey this is a spy noir film. It's supposed to be in black and white because that's what most noir films are known for is that just being black and white and I already filmed like the 
the theater scene in color, so I just changed the camera settings to black and white, and you know, with the idea of like color correcting the theater scene to being black and white in post. So after I filmed what I needed from that theater, I began filming odd parts around downtown, filming random stuff like walking left to right, you know, different directions, uh, and I shot it all in black and white. And sometimes I felt like I was doing a risky thing because, like, I left the camera with a tripod by itself. Sometimes I wouldn't get like good shots of me like going a little too far because, uh, like, I get far enough, like, across the block, they immediately turn around, and start going towards the camera and all that. Because I saw some random guy passing by the camera, it's like, oh no, he's going to steal my camera. I filmed this one shot of like the chair, it's like, oh, I found an office, and he wasn't in his office and all that. So I just filmed this shot of the chair being on it by itself. After what I thought of filming enough footage for the town, I decided to go to the bar, which was right next to the theater. And it was an all ages bar. You know, I got like my, my glass of spray with a little like bowl of popcorn and all that. And I sat with like uh, with another group and all that who, uh, who was like mutuals with and all that. And they, they got Western and they were trying to come up like, oh, what should we do for Western and all that. And as they left, I sat in the, the bar with my bar buddies and all that. And over it's by myself. So I called up and I was like, Emmett, we got like Spy Noir and he sounded like he was about to fall asleep and this was around like 8 eight thirty and all that like eight o'clock or so and he's like well what do we got he's like you know spy noir and all that he's like oh okay and i was like oh we gotta come up with a better story because the story we came up with wasn't good he's like oh, all right I, I forgot how we ended the call but it, it didn't sound like emma wanted to talk about story ideas he sounded like he was about to fall asleep i was like oh okay sorry you know i hanged up and so i was sitting there trying to think like what should i do what should i do when i came back home i was trying to think like what should i do what should i do and like i started writing on my typewriter up until two in the morning i was like oh I have an idea and all that and this idea was like the spy some the agency had told him like oh you have to find this guy because he stole a key and all that and the key is like very important to like some place i basically wrote out a biography piece if it was written as by the spy you know talking about the story on doing this one case when i was writing this small biography i was imagining in my head that it might look like an interview like this was a retired spy and talking about like one of his cases he worked he was working on not like his final one but one of is many cases he worked on and all that and it was like you know wearing dark sunglasses and like he had like a camera right in front of it and he's talking to the interviewer and the interviewer tells him hello thanks for the interview and he goes you're welcome i didn't finish it because i think by two in the morning i was like oh, i'm going to bed i might as well have a good night's sleep from for sad from friday night then get everything working on Saturday and get everything done by Sunday with no sleep in between those two days. So Saturday came around and it was a day of filming and all that. And I decided to have everything set in my house because I was thinking, oh, we could do different locations and all that. I was like, well, no, might as well keep everything in my house. So like, or we film like all the city shots. So might as well have it in my house and all that. So that way when we're done filming in the house, then we could just start editing immediately and all that. And I told this to him, I think like the night before the, the morning and all of that. So I called him up and he was supposed to show up at 12 or like we were supposed to pick him up at 12 and go filming around and all of that. I called him and was like, oh, can you come over here? You know, he's like, oh, I don't have a ride. I was like, what do you mean you don't have a ride? He was like, oh, my par my dad left to pick up my mom and all of that. Okay, when do you know he's going to come back? He's like, I don't know. Can you give an estimation when he's going to come back? I don't, I don't know. There was an awkward phone call and I was like thinking, yeah, he's not going to show up at all. We had to hang up and all that. I was like thinking, great, I have to make this entire short film by myself. During that awkward phone call and after I hanged it up, I was in the kitchen of the house and my grandma invited this alcoholic to the house who is unfortunately my uncle who has failed rehab. And he walks into the kitchen and he asks like, you know, what's going on? I told him the whole ordeal like, you know, we were planning to make the short film today but my friend didn't show up so now I'm here to do it by myself. I have to get it done by tomorrow. And in response, he said something that was kind of like like struck out to me sort of but he was essentially saying that Emmett is not a winner but I am the winner he's referring to me because I don't give up it was something in the long lines of that and although it was said in a drunken state I kind of felt a little better about myself about it like well, okay I'm, I think I could do this so after he gave me his drunk advice I headed towards my room and wrote out like two pages of like 
dialogue in the scene where like you know the spy arrives at the house he has to get a key he finds a key and then he confronts this, the janitor character you know the man who stole the key and they have a confrontation that ends with like you know the spy killing him and just seeing the key and leaving the house if Emma was able to show up he was supposed to play the other guy but because he didn't, my plan was to play both characters, you know, the spy and the other guy. And, you know, do cutaways so that way both characters don't have to be in the same shot. I finished writing this scene, but I had to wait an hour before the living room became available because, you know, my alcoholic uncle and my grandma were in the house. But when they left, I went to the living room and, you know, started getting ready to film the scene. Shot one, take one action. Uh, supposed to be standing right here right here so I start filming and immediately I start forgetting my lines all right take five let's just uh, start from here that's agent Torrance for you ever since we let you go from the organization what else did I say organization organization you mean this key the one that you stole? You mean this key? The, you mean this key? The stolen pro Okay, cop. We have security footage of you stealing this key from the safe. Your little partner didn't help you out with the inside job plan you got. Alright. Oh. It started getting worse as I, the filming kept going along and all that. Yes, and is that why you stole it? You gotta be kidding me while during in a take. All right, Cub. My main concern when filming the scene was for my dog to not bark at anything or so ruin the sound. Instead, he started scratching the door because he knew I was in the living room and he wanted to come inside. I let him inside, but he started whining because he wanted to actually go out to the front yard and usually he wants me to like you know let him out so he could run away for like 30 or so minutes into until he comes back where he goes i need some water or i need some food but i didn't let him do that so he was you know in the living room looking at me and whining no i'm not going outside stay while i'm recording and don't whine Just stop whining for a bit, okay? No, stop whining. Well, what is it? No, no, sit. That's Agent Torrance for you. But not, not in the take right now. All right, come. And then there'll be times like, I'll have a good take, you know, keep going. And then something happens like, you know, my stepmom opens the door and I go, great. It was so loud, I have to do that again. Yes, I know what it is. This is why my organization wants it back. During a take, wow. My arm is killing me right now. And then my grandma will be loudly talking on her phone from her room and all that. None of the walls in the house is soundproof and all. So, so, and the hallways don't have like a closed door. So I, I could hear it from the living room and all that. I was like, great. So I had to wait by most of the time filming that one scene just to like get it done and all that. Every minute by, we're losing life. All right, three, two, one, and action. Cut. And by the time I was able to get a good take of my side, the detective character and all that, or he lost a lot of sunlight. 
so I couldn't film the other scene or else it would just be completely dark and all that. I was like, oh boy. Now it's like I'm blanking what, what I did for the next five hours. I think like the next five, six hours just me being miserable like like in my room and all that like what I'm going to do. Then I thought like I'm going to film a narration scene so I could fill in the gaps of the second character and all that. So like if I have to cut to something and all that, I cut to the narration part. For the narration sequence, I thought back the idea of like, you know, doing it for the whole interview thing. But I thought it would just been easier to just have it like set in a bar because I didn't have like a second tripod for like an additional camera to imply the bag like, oh, we're filming an interview. How we're going to film part easy. I just set up like black drape and in the kitchen and all that and use the kitchen table as a bar table and get a glass of water and just start drinking that. And there we go, you know, it's a bar. So I went forward with that idea. After 12 o'clock when everybody went to bed, now is my time to use the kitchen and all that. So I started filming down. Action. You know, I was on a recent case recently and all that. It was a very odd case. Um, my organization told me that, that one of the janitors took away a key from a guy named Janitors. I only filmed about like three takes of the bar scene because it was a miserable filming of that. It was, so, it was me forgetting my line. It was also like the random noises that I kept popping up like I noticed that my my stove kept making popping sounds like plastic hitting against plastic type of sounds or like metal hitting against metal and I did like two takes of one angle then did another angle and all of that and I, I was drinking like three glasses of water I was like do I have to drink a fourth glass for another take so I ended up there after filming the narration scene I quickly started working on editing the short film now for the workflow I decided to edit scene by scene which I usually do with most of my short films instead of like you know putting all the footage in the timeline and like assembling it all together. I was relying mostly on the narration part of the scene because that's going to take up like, you know, that's going to tell most of the story there, unfortunately, because, you know, film is like showing and not telling. So s Sunday morning, like very early morning, like past midnight, of course, was me just editing the entire short film and all that. And it was the only fun part because like the only thing that's going to bother me it's, it's just like anything outside my headphones, but you know, I just got these takes and to get them good and all that. So I try and make sure every scene worked on a visual basis. So when I put them all together and having the narration scene as a basis for the entire short film, if a scene wasn't working out, like for example, like the, con the whole confrontation scene at the house, because like, you know, there's no cutaway for the other character. I just cut to the near, like the narration part of like, you know, me talking about the event. And some parts I couldn't get edited out and all that. Anytime I said like, um, but in case, or like, like certain like repeated phrases. And that's mainly because of the way I talk is like my words just merge with each other. So there isn't like enough airtime between two separate words, but. It didn't count for the fact that we had security cameras all recording him and all of that. I was just running around and didn't find anybody and all of that. So I went to go to the cinema and watch a movie. It was one weird movie and all that. The tracker on his phone started finally working and all of that. You know, being in this type of situation where somebody's trying to kill you and all of that. It went like that, like to his chest and all that. So he fell down and I think he was slowly dying and all that. So if I try to cut out those phrases, it would sound like jump cuts and it wouldn't like sound very good and all. So I just had what I had to work with. While editing the short film, I sort of gave live updates, which was kind of funny to do. Like on Twitter and Discord, I posted about, you know, listening to Dark Side of the Moon while editing the short film and how, you know, how much of a vibe that was. Which I realized it was apparently posted 6 in the morning, which is kind of odd to me and all that because I felt like that was posted way earlier. Probably did that on Discord first and like, oh, I should put this on Twitter. And I think it was around 4 o'clock, I started falling asleep. Like literally, like, you know, I'd be on the, on the arrow keys going frame by frame and I would be falling asleep like this because I decided to use the recliner chair to edit on that because it was like, oh, that's more comfortable and all that wouldn't be in too much pain for I sit on a plastic chair. It's like, might as well be on a recliner chair doing that. So I was like falling asleep and I was like, oh no, only have 
like more than 10 hours to get this done and also was kind of dreading because like exploring time took a little while as I was like oh, I was like, oh god I can't get I, I don't think I could get this done when I was getting close to finishing the uh, final cut of the short film I decided to cut out this one part of dialogue Liam crew was probably had like a fun field day on that on that time around you know it wasn't too complex to clean up and all that you know the crew from my organization but I was overthinking about the scene, like, you know, to cut it out, mainly because I there's a rule with, with the uh, challenge, which is to keep the content PG-13 and under. So this piece of dialogue I had, I was like thinking like, oh, it's going to go too far for PG-13. So I decided to cut it out, thinking I might have a better chance on, you know, getting the short film into the contest and all that. By 11 o'clock, I finished the short film. I finished editing it. Like, you know, I did finish the final cut. And my plan was to sleep from 12 to 5 because I had to turn into short film by 6 and I had no sleep at all. But I had to show up for my stepmom's birthday party so I did that instead of sleeping in. That was fine, I was just like editing other projects going along and all that. But then I was also falling asleep so as I would go fright, it happened again so I will go frame by frame then like you know go down and fall asleep again then the time came around to like you know actually deliver the short film thankfully i called up my friend ahead of time and he agreed to like you know drive me there and all that so we arrived at the theater and it wasn't a long line surprisingly there wasn't that much people there i think there was only one person ahead of me and i turned in my short film and the event organizer was there and he was like so how was the challenge and i was like oh it was a miserable experience and he was like oh okay and it was, he sort of laughed at that, like, you know, my pure honesty about it, which it was pretty miserable to do. And my friend drove me back to ooh, the party, and I think I fell asleep on the couch because there was apparently a, um, you know, that you say happy birthday to you. And I missed that because, like, w like when I woke up, like, I went over to the back area where they were having the party, and I was like, oh, look, they already cut the cake. So there was a lot of anticipation about the challenge until Friday came around. It's the day of the day, the premiere event of the challenge where all the top 16 short films get to be shown. I was nervous about the event and all that and I my, new, my nerves sort of cooled down when I met up with some friends and all that and they were wishing me luck because you know I worked on the entire short film by myself and they were wishing me luck like you better get into the top 16. And I met this one mutual. I had. I'm not going to name him, even though he has an IMDb page. Uh, I met him through Film Club, and he agreed on to edit my short film CIA Ninja. This was around time in November when I started filming it back in 2023. He hasn't picked up my call since December or answered my emails. So when I saw him at the event, I was like, "Hey, how's it going?" And, it was, oh, and he said, "Oh, it's going pretty good." And he proceeds to turn his attention to like a group of other people he was talking to. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to bring up this whole ordeal about, you know, him not responding to my emails or like picking up my calls until after the event. I get into the theater and I decided to sit alone, mainly because I had the confidence to think like if my short film ends up in the top 16, I could stand on my own to show that I worked on the short film entirely by myself. The event started with a 15 minute overture. It was like a 15 minute timer on screen. And it was kind of funny because you hear the crowd of the 250 people just groaning like going oh because they were so excited it's like now's the time we're going to start and wait 15 minutes <laughs> and then they're showing the collage of group photos and all that because like one of the things they said in content is like oh make sure you attach a group photo to like the short film and all that and i did make group photos of myself i was trying to pick the one that I looked mis miserable with and the less tired one and they show that and during that collage and all that and that was pretty awesome it's like hey that's me and i heard people clapping and i was like thinking i'm not sure if those people know me or they're clapping for the fact that i did that i'm only by myself and nobody else is with me and all that i noticed when watching the entirety of that collage was that like I was the, apparently the only team that worked by themselves like the only one person team like literally the lowest that went aside from me was like three people and the highest was 11 people and all that so I was like feeling like maybe I might get into the top 16 after the 15 minutes the event organizer went up stage and he was like oh I'm so I'm so glad we're here today and all that I'm pretty excited for this event and I was like, okay, I'm pretty excited as well. It was like a fierce competition because like 55 teams like entered the contest. 
44 of them were only able to like turn it in and, and so I was like thinking like oh I have a better chance for my short film to showing up and then they were like oh we have one more presenter I saw the mutual go up on stage and all that and you know the guy who was great to who editing on CIE Ninja and he was like oh guys I'm so excited about this event and all that I've been pretty busy recently so I didn't enter this year because I started my own production company and I'm making my own feature film and I was like oh that's why he didn't answer my emails or my phone calls. Funny enough, as of today of recording of September 2024, he still hasn't answered my emails. <laughs> I wonder what's going on there. And then they started showing the short films. Like, like, oh boy. Most of them were good and all that. I felt like we're thinking about uh, throughout the entire showcase. Event organizer was like, oh, we put them in random order. And for some reason, the order made it look like the production value went up with every single short film. I had these weird thoughts in my head. Like, I thought the camera didn't matter. Only the story mattered when it came to making a short film. Why everything is looking better with every short film being shown and all that. So I was having some doubts. The ninth one was like, yeah, I didn't end up in it. Because the, the, the ninth short film had a similar story to my short film. But it was done with like a four or five person crew. And I felt like it was done much more better than my short film. So I was like thinking like, maybe a looking chance it will end up in the 16th short film shown. Then after they show all 16 short films, they're like, well, that's all the short films. So I was like... What? This is kind of weird to say. I felt a little outcasted, and that wasn't the feeling I wanted all that, but like, th that's what I ended up feeling. I felt like everybody in the theater knew each other because they were been doing this for years. And I sat like in a in a air in the theater and on that next to these people who, who just didn't sat at all. They just stand by the entrance and they were screaming very loudly, like "Yo, that's awesome! Yo, we know that guy!" And all I'm thinking in my head is like, "Guys, could you just shut up? I'm trying to watch these short films. Sure, crowds cheering, that's fine, but like." Still, you're very, being very loud. So I kind of felt outcasted in that sense and all that, that everybody knew each other and I barely knew who anybody, which isn't true. And that's what I was feeling at that moment. So I was like feeling miserable because the thing is, I accepted the fact before the showing that I might not get into the top 16 or I might get into the top 16. But my confidence was mainly towards like, I will get in to the top 16 on the factor that I made this entire short film by myself and then consider the fact that that wasn't like really part of the concept like oh how many people worked on this short film I felt like I needed to be acknowledged like like I made this entire thing by myself all the short films I got in top 16 were made by more than three people and all that and you had two short films made by 10 to 11 people before they gave out the awards they showed like a montage of all the other short films I didn't get in and there was me there my short film was like oh there's my 15 seconds of fame and then it went away and I was like, oh, this is how it feels like to get a participation award. And the short film that won like the most awards, which is like two, like I think it was like best actor and best short film in general, was the one that had a crew of 11. And the main leader of that 11 person team went up like on the mic and was like, man, I was seeing the other montage and they look really great and all that. I forgot what was the exact phrasing, but basically he was saying like, they look great enough to be in a contest. I wish they were in the contest. And I was like, if my short film was great, why didn't you get up in the contest? Was my short film bad? The event ended and I left. I was singing to Lowe's in the bar right next to the theater by myself with my glasses bright and my bar buddies it was 9 30 and all that and I told my parents to pick me up at 9 and usually they come 30 minutes late it's 9 30 and they called me up and they're like oh we're going to be there in two minutes so I was standing outside under the theater and all that because it was like raining oh the irony to match with my uh with my feeling <laughs> it's raining outside my stepmom picks me up with my stepsister and all that they're like so how's the show and I was like, well, I didn't get in, and they only showed my short film for 16 seconds and all that. And she was like, oh, don't worry. There will be next year and all that. This is a learning experience. You know, you can improve yourself and you probably get there next year. And I was like thinking, I already know this. I already know there's a next year. I know like that and all that. I know this is a learning experience. It'll make a short film in 48 hours. I like already knew this, and I was like thinking like, I didn't need to hear this when I'm currently being miserable and all that. I didn't tell them that I was just kept it to myself because I part because I didn't want to really sit through a lecture saying like you gotta accept that you gotta lose sometimes and all that. I was like I already know I'm going to lose sometimes, but like this was like like really like a like a punch to the guts type of situation for me. Went back home, 
you know, when my room just lay there bed I, I feel like I needed to get a knowledge like I said before I, I made this entire thing by myself I was able to get it done but that didn't really matter to me that I was able to get it done in 40 hours what mattered to me was like getting into the top 16 to show for the fact that I could do things on my own when everybody says no to me when I ask them for help and all that and I, I felt miserable because like I failed accomplishing that goal and all that I, I, I felt really terrible I was like oh god it, oh sure there's a next year but that doesn't go well how, how many next years do I have to keep going and all that next year next year next year until I finally get in like how far behind I am from everybody who somehow got in I thought back to high school and I, in freshman year I tried to audition for the talent show. I auditioned for it as a comedy routine and didn't get into the talent show and all that. Talent show teacher who was also my theater teacher next year after that was like I know students who audition for the talent show every year and they don't get into, get into it until senior year. And I was like oh I hope that's not me. The next year was 2020. Everything was restricted to online because of COVID-19. They had a talent show in 2021, but I didn't end up entering because I didn't understand like how could you have a, like a talent show online. In my third year, I was forced to move into a different high school. My senior year, they actually did start up a talent show and I did sign up for it, but unfortunately it was canceled because not many people signed up for it. And at the end of my senior year, I also premiered my short film, The Nice Gal. And the premiere took place like after school. And on the day premiere, I invited my video production class, all 30 students at the time, and I invited them to the premiere. Uh, not one of them actually spared time to actually show up to the premiere at all. But at least like uh, my English teacher who gave some notes about the script, uh, the two of the extras and two of the cast members, uh, Jaden and Susie, ended up showing up to the event. So I appreciate that, but I was kind of a little shocked about the fact that like not one out of the 30 students couldn't spare like 30 minutes after school to like uh, watch my short film. They were very eager to go back home, probably. Is this just going to be a prevailing theme in my life? If I try to set up for something like some big event of something on my own, like nobody's there to show up or like, or like barely I get a small acknowledgement of it. So during the weekend after the premiere, I mostly had miserable thoughts about the whole ordeal and all that, and then I feel very happy about it. And I consulted with some friends like during the week afterward, and they made me realize I have to recognize the fact that, you know, I technically did, you know, did a pretty good achievement of making a short film 48 hours. I achieved one success that I was not intending to do, which is make a short film 48 hours. But I felt like I was already, I already knew how to do that because like it was with my earlier short films, we shot them in three hours, you know? Well, technically we already had like story planned ahead of time, but like, you know, we finished it in three, one hour, we edited in camera and all that. So I thought, you know, 48 hour film challenge would it be like too much of a hassle unless I had a team. And then, you know, when that didn't work out and I had to work on myself, I was like, okay, I gotta work on myself. But then that ended up being a miserable experience because nothing went and right for me. And so I achieved one success, which is that, you know, I was able to make a short film in 48 hours. I did not achieve my goal that I set out to attend, which is to, you know, uh, show everybody who said no to me that I see I could do all this on my own. I don't need you people and all that. I could like make an entire short film um, by myself and get into the top 16 and maybe win an award. I don't need an award, but if I got in top 16, you see what kind of skill set I have. I think they probably just probably pretty arrogant of me to go like with that idea. I think I'm kind of blindsided by the flaws of it. A short film probably does have flaws, but I'm not seeing with my own eyes and all of them. And if I saw them, I probably like you know understand more why you know I was I was not able to get my short film into the top 16 and all that. Why the judges go like, ah, oh, there's a better one out there, you know? We don't need we don't need this one to show up on screen and all that. But for me, it's still kind of punched to the gut when I, you know, didn't get into the top 16 and all that because, like, I put so much effort to, like, you know, get this done and all that. And just to see that effort not, you know, recognized in a way by the people I want to get recognized by, it really sucks to have that feeling like, oh, all this effort for nothing. Well, technically it was for something, you know, I got a short, another short film added to my filmography and all that. I think I'll probably figure out a way, like, uh, I'll probably learn something from here and all that, but now I have, like, a bit of appreciation, like, after the whole ordeal. Now I have, like, appreciation at the fact that, like, you know, 
I managed to do that all by myself in 48 hours <laughs> in a, that short amount of time. But I couldn't recognize that part because like, you know, I had a one set goal and like I didn't get that goal at all. So now the question uh, comes down to this. Would I do this again? Yes. Not because it was fun, because it wasn't fun at all. It wasn't, well, technically, aside from the editing part, that was the fun part. But filmmaking isn't about fun. <laughs> That's what Terry Gilliam said and all that. And so I would join it again, more like a challenge to myself, going like, I could do it again, and uh, hopefully I'll get in. Maybe I might get around, get in next year and all that. If not, then there's another year, another year, another year. It's just get, probably gets pretty depressing afterwards. Not getting to the top 16 made me feel like how, like I said before, how far behind I am from everybody else and all that, where they were able to get in, but I wasn't. Like, I have all this, like, experience, you know, making my own short films, and, you know, I thought I was pretty good, but apparently not good enough for the judges. Hopefully, uh, I get better in skill in a way, so that way I make a better short film for the 48-hour film challenge. Maybe I could work with a team. So I will do it again, you know, just to try to like see if I can actually, you know, succeed next time around and all that. Maybe I could probably make it with different intentions, you know, not like I gotta get into the top 16 part. Like, this is going to be a nice fun experience where I'm supposed to learn. You know, something like part of like my seven home say and all of that. So yeah, so that's the video. Have a nice day and later on come back to our video store.